The United States currently has the most advanced space program of any country in the world. We have NASA, the only space agency to have successfully visited every single planet in the solar system so far, and the only one to have sent humans to the moon. If we don't mess everything up, then the United States is in a perfect position to become the first country to colonize space. This video was originally meant to be a sequel to my video about China's plans for a moon base, but unfortunately, the US currently doesn't have any plans to build a moon base. There is the Artemis program, which aims to send humans back to the moon, build a lunar space station, and prepare for the construction of a moon base, as well as eclipse missions that will search for water ice and locations to build it. But all we have is preparation, not actual concrete plans for how we'll create a lunar base. So, this video will be more generally about how the US plans to colonize space, because there are a lot more interesting things to talk about there. Of course, it's not just NASA that's involved in this. There are dozens of American companies all trying to do their own space projects, as well as the US Space Force. The Space Force has its own classified space plane called the X-37 that stays in orbit for a few months doing who knows what. To keep this simple, I'll be including the American space companies like SpaceX, Sierra Space, Blue Origin, and all the others in this video. The US government already relies on SpaceX to get crew to the International Space Station and to get satellites to orbit, for example. And SpaceX in turn relies on the US government for some funding. I should also explain what I mean by colonization. The International Space Station, for example, is not a colony. It doesn't have a permanent population and is entirely reliant on Earth for supplies. Colonies have to have permanent populations and be at least somewhat self-sufficient. So far, even with all the space development that's currently going on, no country is anywhere close to making space colonies. But making bases or laboratories like the ISS or Tiangong Station are within reach. So are other forms of space infrastructure, like satellites and orbital factories. So for this video, I'll be talking about near-future stuff. Things that we could see happen this century. I'm only going to be talking about things that have plans in the works, or concepts that could theoretically become real plans soon. So the very early stages of colonization. Of all the future space plans the US has, the Artemis program is probably the most well-known. But the Artemis program is a lot bigger than people think. It's a lot more than just SLS and trying to get humans back to the moon. The CLIPS program, or Commercial Lunar Payload Services, is a part of Artemis that aims to get companies to land US payloads on the moon. So far, it hasn't gone very well. Astrobotics Peregrine 1 mission failed to reach the moon and burned up in Earth's atmosphere, and Intuitive Machine's IM-1 mission successfully landed but fell over on its side and broke a landing leg. But CLIPS should hopefully get better from here. The IM-2 mission is targeting a landing at Shackleton Crater this year in 2024, and the somewhat underrated Blue Ghost 1 mission from Firefly Aerospace will be targeting a landing at Mercurium, also trying to launch this year. The Griffin 1 mission, also by Astrobotic, could potentially fly in 2024 as well, but from what I can tell, it will likely be delayed till 2025, because it's carrying an extremely important payload, the Viper rover. Viper is a rover built by NASA meant to survive for 100 days on the moon. Unlike Mars rovers, which have several objectives, Viper only has one goal, look for water ice on the lunar south pole. Viper is probably the most important space mission launching in the very near future. Viper is going to look for water ice on the moon. If this mission fails to successfully land or fails to find water ice, then the US's lunar colonization plans will be set back for years, if not decades. Viper needs to succeed, and given how Peregrine 1 went, the chances don't seem all that high right now. Unfortunately, the constant NASA budget cuts have forced NASA to give important missions like this to private companies. Hopefully, CLIPS improves from here. Several companies all having the ability to land private payloads on the moon will be a good thing, and the US is slowly making it happen. But there have been a lot of failures so far, and overall, from what I've seen, CLIPS is the most controversial part of the Artemis program. Luckily, it only gets better from here. The next part of the Artemis program is the construction of Gateway Station, the first permanent space station around the moon. The plans for Gateway actually predate Artemis, but due to problems with development, it was restructured and made part of the Artemis program. Construction of Gateway Station is already going well, and the first modules are on track for a launch in 2027. Like CLIPS, Gateway Station isn't without its controversy. There's a large number of people who see Gateway as an unnecessary intermediate step, and that we should skip it and go straight to building a moon base. However, Gateway Station should actually become pretty useful for lunar missions. If something were to go wrong during the trip, like what happened during the Apollo 13 mission, the crew could use Gateway as a lifeboat. This is also true for if crews on the surface ever have to abort a mission and get back to space quickly. Gateway will also be useful for robotic missions, as astronauts can operate robots from the station with no signal lag like you get if you were operating them from Earth, without having to go down to the moon. There's also the possibility of Gateway acting as an asteroid spotter, able to see asteroids headed towards Earth before ground-based telescopes can. All in all, Gateway is a pretty good idea, and progress is going well on building it. The first crew should go to Gateway during Artemis 4, and more modules will slowly be added over additional Artemis missions. Gateway is also where we'll see the first large-scale international cooperation of the Artemis program. 
The European Space Agency, Canada, Japan, and the United Arab Emirates are all building parts for this station, as well as several U.S. companies. The Artemis program actually has a ton of international cooperation. The Artemis Accords is an international agreement made by the U.S. to allow peaceful colonization of the moon. All countries that sign the Artemis Accords have to help the Artemis program in some way, and there are 43 countries that have signed it as of the time of making this, from India to Canada to Angola. While the U.S. is spearheading the entire Artemis program, it is a very international program. The U.S. has already promised to bring the first Japanese astronaut to the moon on one of the future Artemis missions, which, unless China gets there first, will be the first non-American on the moon. In exchange for this, Japan is creating a pressurized lunar rover for astronauts on the moon. But to develop the moon and space in general, we need a powerful rocket. And the most powerful rocket in existence is currently in development by a U.S. company, Starship. I've said this in other videos before, but whatever opinions you have about Elon Musk, you have to agree it's incredible how much SpaceX has been able to do. They made the first reusable rockets, they've been carrying crew to the ISS for years, and are currently designing Starship. People with negative opinions about Elon Musk tend to not like SpaceX because of him, but it's extremely important to separate Musk and SpaceX. Regardless of what you think of him, the thousands of engineers and people working at SpaceX have done amazing things. Starship is an absolute monster of a rocket. The recent IFT-4 test proved that. Starship was actively disintegrating, and somehow managed to not only survive, but make a successful soft landing. It literally survived burning up on re-entry, the thing that's killed dozens of rockets, including the space shuttle Columbia. Starship is the biggest, most powerful rocket ever created, and it was just proven that it can reach space and come down intact. This rocket is going to be the future of space travel. Starship has the capability to launch entire space stations in single launches, and the company Airbus already plans to do that with their loop station. And Starship will also be landing humans on the moon, with a Starship HLS variant. The Starship Human Landing System, or Starship HLS, will carry humans to the moon on Artemis 3 and several of their missions. Currently, Artemis 3, the first crewed landing of the Artemis program, is targeting a launch date in September 2026, but that's likely to be delayed. Sometime in 2027 or 2028 is more likely. Starship can carry enormous amounts of cargo to the moon, but needs a ton of fuel. As in, upwards of 15 separate Starship launches fill of just fuel to get one ship enough to get to the moon. This sounds like a lot, but if SpaceX can get Starship to become rapidly reusable, which they are already on track to do, this might not be as hard as it seems. The IFT-5 mission happening in a few months will likely be the first attempt to catch the Starship booster at the launch tower, which is an extremely important step towards full reusability. After that, serious development for Starship HLS can begin. Currently, SpaceX is planning to make an uncrewed landing demo on the moon of Starship HLS sometime in 2026, but that's subject to change. For near-future space development, Starship is going to change everything. And that's not all SpaceX is doing. Their upcoming Polaris Dawn mission will make the first ever spacewalk by a private company, and SpaceX has already built their own custom spacesuit that will be used during the mission. The Polaris program in general is already extremely ambitious, and the third Polaris mission will very likely be the first crewed test of Starship. The Falcon Heavy will be delivering the first gateway modules to the moon. SpaceX has already launched several classified missions for the Space Force, and of course, they have Starlink. Starlink is already becoming pretty profitable, and successfully getting internet to areas that wouldn't otherwise have it. And launching Starlink and other payloads will only become easier with Starship. SpaceX, of course, has its problems, but all in all, it's been a net positive for the space industry and will continue to be. That being said, there are other US ships in development that will be good for other purposes. Like Sierra Space's Dream Chaser, which is a space plane similar to the space shuttle that will hopefully launch in 2025 and help deliver cargo to the ISS, and eventually construct the Orbital Reef space station. The first Dream Chaser, Tenacity, is almost fully complete. Sierra Space is already working on creating inflatable habitats for Orbital Reef, and development so far has already gone well. There's also Blue Origin's New Shepard and New Glenn rockets. New Shepard is already doing suborbital space tourism right now, but New Glenn is going to be a massive rocket like Starship once it's completed. The first flight of New Glenn is already slated to be carrying a NASA mission to Mars, and New Glenn will also help construct Orbital Reef. SpaceX fans like to not take Blue Origin seriously, but they've been doing suborbital space tourism flights for years now, and they're designing a lunar lander, a very powerful rocket, and a space station on top of that. Speaking of space stations, there are several currently in the works for the US, by the government or private companies. Axiom Station is probably the most famous. The modules of the station will be attached to the ISS, eventually detaching and becoming its own space station once the ISS is deorbited. With Starship, Dream Chaser, and several other rockets and ships, the US is set to have several new space stations in the near future, which will be very important, as Low Earth Orbit is actually a very good place to make things like medicine and fiber optic cables. The lack of gravity removes imperfections in them, making them both more effective. 
This has a reason to create orbital factories, and making medicine in space has already been tested by the company Varda to space. Axiom Space, the same company building Axiom Station, is also creating the spacesuits that will be used on the moon during the Artemis program. Currently, the entire American space industry is focused on one thing, getting humans back to the moon and into space in a big way. The more I was researching this video, the more I saw this. There's plenty of competition going on right now, like Blue Origin trying to sue SpaceX, as well as Stoke Space competing with them, but there's also a ton of cooperation. Aside from the bad actors and scam companies that always pop up with things like this, all of the major space companies really seem like they actually want humanity to have a future in space, and I think it's interesting how everyone is coming at it from a different angle. Information about what's going on is decently well available, and other than the Space Force, military projects, and the usual company secrets, there isn't much secrecy in the space industry. Except, of course, for Astroforge. Astroforge is trying to become the first asteroid mining company. They're launching a mission called Brocker 2 to a near-Earth asteroid to survey it for future mining missions. But we don't know which asteroid this is, because they're keeping it a secret. They say the reason they're doing this is to avoid risks, which is a terrible reason. Nobody's going to steal this asteroid from them, the only reason they're keeping it a secret is because they want sole credit for any discoveries made there. But whether they're in the right or not, they're keeping this asteroid a secret, and clearly don't want anyone to know what asteroid they're going for until after the launch. Anyways, the Brocker 2 mission is probably going to the asteroid 2010 CD55. Astroforge did a terrible job at keeping it a secret. We know when the mission is launching, alongside IM2. We know how long the mission will take to get there, and what type of asteroid it is. That narrowed down the list to 33 potential asteroids, and 2010 CD55 is the most likely target. Keeping secrets in space is completely stupid. There are a lot of people in the space community with entirely too much free time on their hands, and they can and will figure out any mystery you give them. Even if the target isn't 2010 CD55, it has to be one of the 32 other candidates, since there aren't any other asteroids the mission could possibly reach. Hopefully, this will be a lesson to other space companies to not try to keep secrets. Brocker 2 is an exciting mission, and it's a shame Astroforge is ruining their own reputation by trying to keep the target a secret. Space exploration should be free and open to everyone. Secrets have no place here. Anyways, there are plenty of projects that are a bit further into the future too. Many of these are just concepts for now, but could become real plans in the near future. NASA and DARPA are working together to create a nuclear rocket by 2027, but I don't think that's actually going to happen anytime soon. Northrop Grumman is working on designs for what they're calling a lunar railroad network to make exploration and resource extraction on the moon easier. And before we build moon trains, we'll need moon rovers, which several companies are already working on for future Artemis missions. It's safe to say that when the US finally returns astronauts to the moon, they'll have plenty of ways to get around. If only we actually started making plans for building a base. There are a few concepts, including tipping over the starships astronauts use to arrive in to make habitats, which I think is the most likely way we'll build a base. But nothing has been confirmed yet, unlike China, which has made their plans for the construction of a base public. Hopefully we get around to it soon. A lot of these projects may fail. I wouldn't be surprised if over half the things I mentioned in this video were significantly delayed or outright cancelled. It happened recently with the Deer Moon mission, which was originally supposed to take a crew of civilians, including Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, around the moon on a starship, but was cancelled. The history of spaceflight is littered with failed projects. But even if only half of these projects actually happen, then the United States is in for a glorious future in space in the years to come. And once one project succeeds, its successors will follow. We're at the beginning of a space race, and once we get this ball rolling, it'll be extremely difficult to stop. The US has problems, and there are other countries like China trying to beat us to the moon. But there are a ton of projects to look forward to, as I've hopefully shown. I originally wanted this video to be a bit longer, but I wanted to get this out by the 4th of July because I thought it would be fitting, so I cut a bit out. There's a lot I didn't mention in this video, and a lot to get excited about. I truly believe that in the near future, in the next few decades, the US will have a significant presence in space, more so than it already does. And because it works so closely with other countries, it will hopefully lead to access to space increasing across the world. And that can only be a good thing. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, check out my other videos about space and space colonization.